Hello everyone, my name is Chris, I walk on my hobby blog. Oh my gosh, I have... I am making my way through something that I have recently been recommended and hounded about te technically. I don't want to put uh, bad graces on this wonderful human, uh, Daisuke. He, anytime the subject has come up when we talked, he has heavily recommended this film by Misaki Kobayashi, The Human Condition. Today we are going to talk about part one. That's all I've seen. This is a nine and a half hour film. And I am just blown away. This movie is absolutely incredible. Probably one of the best I've ever seen. And that's that's talking a lot. That is a very high bar for me. Or for, yeah, for me and oh my gosh. I absolutely adore this movie. I'm not going to talk spoilers, but um, it stars the amazing Tatsuya Nakadai, who was in other films, such as his first film that he was starring in, in Akira Kurosawa's Yoshimbo, where he played the pistol-wielding uh, gangster. And that was his first role he ever had outside of like theater, but he has such range. He is absolutely incredible as an actor, and you can see it in that film especially. But I also want to discuss another movie that he was in. Well, not really discuss, but mention a movie he was in called by Kihachi Okamoto. The Sword of Doom. I haven't opened this yet. I recently got this, but this movie he is amazing in. He plays a villain who kills people, and Toshiro Mifune must, um, I guess, stop him. I haven't seen it in a very long time, but he is the one. Uh, thing I do remember really well but and the last film that he was in is another Masaki Kobayashi film it's one that I absolutely love I've seen it I don't know how many times and Takashi Miike himself one of my favorite directors one of the most unique Japanese directors he remade this and it was just as good as the original Harakiri this movie stars Tatsuya Nakadai playing a 50-year-old when he was in his 20s. And there's a great interview with him on this release where he discusses that and how intimidating it was to be starring in all these films. Because by this point, it's 1962, he had just done The Human Condition, which I'll get to, I, I promise. The, that's my whole point of this video is that. But he discusses how intimidating and how he carried the weight of the Japanese industry when he was starring in all these different films. And he talked about especially in here playing a 50 something year old when he was in his 20s was very very hard. Maybe he was in his late 20s early 30s. Very young is the point. And he discusses throughout the uh, interview how he starred in all these amazing films by all these different directors and how he kind of became the Japanese star even bigger than Toshiro Mifune who I'm a personal fan of I love Toshiro Mifune but to, to circle back if you will to the human condition I think this movie has convinced me that I like Tatsuya Nakadai even more than Toshiro Mifune. This movie is just absolutely incredible and I've only seen the first three and a half hours. It is a nine and a half hour film. I think I mentioned that. And oh my gosh. Um, 
if you don't know what this is about, I can only really discuss the story of the first one, the first part, the first three and a half hours, the first disc. It is spread out in three discs on this release. Like so. And oh my gosh. It is worth it. Oh, uh, I am just blown away by how amazing this movie is. Part one is about Tatsuya Nakadai, um, very stressed out about uh, being drafted into World War II. And he ends up being hired on to go work at a pretty infamous labor camp. What I would call a concentration camp where uh, Chinese, Korean, basically any non-Japanese peoples who have been captured during the war are brought to in order to mine iron ore. And oh my gosh, this, all the acting in this movie, whether it be Tatsuya Nakadai's wife, the character's wife, uh, Mishiko or Mishiko, I believe is how you say it. Um, Cal, who is the Chinese um, laborer who butts heads with authority a, th a lot. He is just wow, amazing. I his entire story is just so powerful. Um. I'm trying not to now, but this entire part just is so powerful that it makes me want to shed tears just thinking about where these characters go. And there are many dramatic moments throughout this movie and many moments of betrayal, many moments of loss and Oh my gosh. Watching emotional the emotional roller coaster that is this movie of very high highs and pretty high lows. Like it never loses its um its emotion. It is just absolutely incredible. And where it ends in part one, I am so, so excited to see where this goes because it is during World War II, and this is from 1959 to 1961. He made it over three years, I guess, 59, 60, and 61. And I don't know how this got made. Um, this is such a huge, heavy subject already, especially so soon after World War II, just 15 years. 15 years ago, I was 10 years old, I will remember that pretty well but for something like wartime world war ii especially especially for the country of japan like i'm sure that lingered heavily in the consciences of the entire nation and so for this film to come out a nine and a half hour critique of the entire japanese government for leading the nation into war and what the director, he discusses in the Harakiri um, release, there's an interview with him from the 90s, I wanna say, where he discusses how he got drafted into World War II and during his time there, he before he even began uh, fighting in the war, he was absolutely anti-war the entire, his entire life. And so when he got drafted, he was just so depressed and just really inflamed, very angry at his nation. And he discusses in the interview how he was offered promotions constantly for his leadership and to become an officer. And he always refused and always rejected those promotions because he wanted to stay a grunt. He wanted to cement his hatred towards war. And what better way than to be right there in the battlefield, having to kill people, humans. And 
this is definitely a film that's anti-war and it is absolutely incredible there are some really powerful anti-war films i think my favorite one is paths of glory starring kirk douglas and this movie there are, there's like two moments that i would say is like great acting by kirk douglas who is the character that we follow who is pretty anti-war and butting heads with the authority figures but in this movie this is a great uh, showcase of the director's thesis statement throughout his filmography that he talks about in the interview he talks about how in all his films that he has ever made he wanted to have the one figure the hero if you will who faces against corruption and powerful forces that win out every time but these heroes continue to fight and that's what he wants in his films is no matter how hard it gets no matter whether you're losing or winning it doesn't matter as long as you continue to fight against those powers and against corruption and all that then you are someone worthy of being called a human and there's a whole monologue in this film by a um character who is a uh, chinese prisoner and tasia nakadai's character kaji i don't think i've mentioned the character's name yet he and this elderly chinese man uh, trade many words throughout this film many uh, wise words sage words words and just all that and there's a spe specific moment when there's a large execution happening because there's an attempted escape from the camp and there are many factors going on in regards to this escape but because i don't want to spoil it but there's a moment when tasia nakadai is preparing to go to this execution a day before it actually is supposed to happen and this elderly man and tatsuya nakadai who is a pretty young spry uh individual uh in terms of this film he's in his 20s again but they are trading words and the chinese man says life is full of mistakes and errors many of them small and forgivable but this trial what you're about to face if you don't stop it this will be your largest error and this will show whether you're a human or a beast wearing a human's mask and oh my gosh that entire epiphany that the elder discusses is just oh my gosh and then the day of the execution itself that entire sequence is like an hour long because again this is a nine and a half hour movie it takes its time but i don't feel the length personally at all i am splitting it up i watched the first half on thursday night and then last night i finished off part one because there are intermissions within each part and so in part one it's right in the middle an hour and a half an hour 45 i think and then part two i don't know what the breakdown is but that's also two parts so six parts total of these three acts it is very three act structure and part one could just be its own movie honestly and i'm so happy it's not because i have no idea well i know the ultimate fate of kaji played by tatsuya nakadai but oh my gosh I am so excited to see where this goes. This movie is just absolutely incredible. I will be kind of documenting my reactions to each part as I go through. I originally wasn't going to because I was like, I don't know. But I decided that I will be 
recording my reactions to each part and I'm gonna release them as one mega video so probably a 30 minute video cons considering that part one is just 15 minutes already but yes the human condition big big thank you to Daisuke Beppu who is a youtuber on here probably the biggest and most popular and most masterful youtuber in my opinion he does he discusses everything criterion he does director breakdowns but this is a film that he has been highly recommending for a while it was recently that i finally bought it and finally decided to jump in and oh my gosh i'm so happy i did but that is part one I will see you guys soon with part two. Hello everyone, I am back and I just finished part two of The Human Condition, or at least disc two, which features parts three and four. And my immediate reaction about this is that it wasn't as amazing as parts one and two, but I still really liked it, really loved it. Well, close to loving it, but there were portions of it that got a bit repetitive, which I think was a conscious decision by Kobayashi, because in this part, you've seen part one, or disc one, parts one and two, so at this point you should know that he has been conscripted into the Imperial Army for World War II. Uh, Tatsuya Nakadai's character, Kaji. He is now a private in the Japanese army in 1944 towards the end and this entire section just really explores the idea of power and of corruption of hierarchy all these different things that um, Misaki Kobayashi experienced when he was in World War II because this film draws heavily from his experience and I think that the repetitive nature of our main character Kaji being beat up consistently by the people higher in power than him and higher in rank and him not being able to do anything multiple times really awful things happen there's a suicide early on in the film at least in this part of the film and he fights it and there's no justice no justice for the person driven to kill himself the man is called weak and is considered uh, a dog and just very disrespected and this was really um apparent because i discussed how i watched an interview with the director on the harakiri uh, released by Criterion and in that he used this film as an example as him exploring how even if someone isn't um, winning or having a victory in terms of them fighting against corruption and just not evil but um, something like that of power corrupting he says that whether you're victorious or not doesn't matter it's that you tried it's that you attempted to do good and it's out of your control in all his movies he discusses he does that of this harakiri uh and a little bit of cried on which i just remember that he also did and that's one of my favorite movies also so this guy He's a real deal as I explore his filmography more. But he discusses in that interview how he was a soldier during World War II and he was offered, um, what's it called, promotions throughout his entire time there because he was just a really good soldier. But that he always refused or rejected it. And during this part of the movie, he it's like I'm watching the director and his experiences because our um, main character does give in to a promotion later on and tries to do some good with that tries to 
not shake things up, but try to reorganize the workflow in terms of how the military is working and he's still just completely undermined and not listened to, uh, mocked. There's a portion of the movie where our main character Kaji is discussing uh, the new recruits coming in that he's going to be in charge of with the veterans. And the veterans just treat him like shit. And I think because I think every director draws from his own personal experiences when making a movie. That's what makes movies interesting to me. But I think especially in that type of um, scenario where he is talking to people higher rank than him, that he, uh, I feel like he's had many of these conversations that our main character Kaji has had. And thinking about it that way, because there were points in the movie where I was like, I'm bored. I'm sick of watching Kaji getting beat up by higher-ups, and then I have to remember, oh, this is what happened to uh, Misaki um, Kobayashi, the director of this film. And because he discusses how he is so anti-Roy, he absolutely hates um, higher-ups. He thinks grunts are woefully disrespected and completely out of control of the situation while those who survived the war who were not grunts the few grunts who survived the war he discusses how he just completely detests higher ups especially those at the very top because they can just point the finger you know at a map and say oh we want to take over this territory okay bomb this bomb this but they aren't held responsible for killing hundreds of thousands of people through the decisions. And he discusses in this interview, which I absolutely love, and I'm going to rewatch it soon after finishing this, because, my God, um, I think I'm going to appreciate it even more after watching this movie. But he discusses just his complete disdain for people who make decisions and aren't punished for them. And that is a very common theme in this section of the movie. There's another portion where Kaji finally has a, uh, I guess an officer, someone who's above him, who is on his side. It's someone he knew from part one of the movie, part one and two, to be specific. I think it was actually in the first 10 minutes when he meets a friend and is talking to him. I think it's the same person. I would have to rewatch this, and I plan to very soon, because my God, this is just incredible. I am really enjoying this. But um, he finally has an officer who is on his side and who doesn't just slap him around. And the entire time he's with him for a very short time, he's just kind of like stay in your lane, keep your head down, like, don't do that, and Kaji is like, no, I'm gonna stick up for these people. All these people are doing things and getting away with it. And there's a another really great scene where people beat Kaji senseless and kind of cover him with blankets, and it's like, the officer walks in, and like, what's going on? And you think that he's going to do something. And he says, okay, I'll overlook it this time, but next time, I'll do something. And they're not going to do, do it again. They're going to abuse him different ways in order to go through that loophole. And that's the entire part three and four for this. Part four, there's actually fighting during World War II against the Russians, which leads to what I know to be this plot of part five and six, the final disc, where... He is apparently becoming a prisoner of the Russian army. And I think that would be very, very haunting. Um, but I think this section of the movie is very much about how power corrupts and how just awful people in authority are. I mean, there are so many points of the movie where you think Kaji will come out on top. And Misaki Kobayashi is like, nope. It's not how it works. 
where we are going to completely show that life is unfair to this guy. And especially to just anybody who was in this position in the real World War II. But yeah, wow. Um, I don't want to talk too much about the plot. I just kind of gave examples of where he was kind of using his thesis statement of his filmography about you know power corruption, uh, authority sucking, um, not low lives, but um, people who are on a lower class, on the lower rung of the class ladder, if you will. His films are very much about how they are completely ignored and very dispensable to those who are higher up in the class system. And this movie definitely shows it. There's a character in this film who is a son of a pretty major army figure in the military at this time. And he is given so much preferential treatment. He is given so much... Um, moments of um, I guess privilege he is one of the veterans I believe who is part of kind of the gang who is like fuck you Kaji I'm not gonna do this and he um, there's a point in the movie where they're not happy with the meals cause they had rice and like chicken but they didn't have a lot of rice and so they're kind of like, hey, Kaji, I order you to go to the recruits and take all the rice and put it in a bucket and then give them half of it and give the rest to us. And Kaji is just like, there's nothing I can do to combat this. So sorry, recruits, I'm going to have to take your food. Why? As they had just put in all the rice into all the bowls and were ready to eat. And it is just just constant beatdowns of Kaji's patience and this is the part I really liked in terms of him fighting back because in part one and two when he's at the camp and he's kind of overseeing um, everything and everyone's like oh theories don't work because he's like an academic and who is very in touch with what actually works but this is the 1940s, so no one tests things out. We, we do it this way because we've always done it this way. We're not going to change it. And that kind of mentality. And there was a point I was going with this, and it just slipped from my mind because I got excited talking about that part. But um, yes, fighting back. So in this part especially, because he's not able to fight back throughout the camp. He does little things, but in the end, he loses as you know by this point if you're watching this but he uh, fights back multiple times during this and he's just kind of like I don't care if I'm punished do whatever but we need justice for the man driven to suicide we need um, the recruits to not be brought up the same way as I have or the veterans even a clearer example of things going wrong in terms of training and keeping things the way they are because that's how it's always been done and just all that it's just i was really happy when he was fighting back and sure justice was not dealt out but again talking about kobayashi's themes out his movies people who fight back and whether they succeed or not doesn't matter it's the fact that you tried and you did your best and i absolutely love that thesis statement i it's very prevalent in Harakiri. Doesn't matter what uh, Tatsuya Nakadai's character plays. He also is in that as the lead, playing a 50 something year old and he's in his 20s. There's a great part of the interview where, um, at least on another interview on that Harakiri set, where he's like, oh my gosh, like I, <laughs> I was doing all these movies, you know, with Kobayashi, Kurosawa. Uh, Otsu, who I actually haven't seen any of his movies. I think that's the next big Japanese director that I want to get into. Uh, I think he was... I don't think he was in a Mizoguchi film. Who I've seen Sancho the Bailiff. That's a really great movie. But um, he talks about how like he was just given like a 400 pound pack and just told 
to carry the weight of a movie as a 24 year old because he was a theater student he did a lots of theater and was a really great actor and then i think kurosawa brought him on to play the pistol wielding villain and yoshimbo but um yeah it was just really nice to see him fight back <laughs> Because, my gosh, in parts one and two, he couldn't fight back, and he didn't try. It was like towards the end, during a uh, during the execution scene, as I stated earlier, that he fought back, finally. And kind of succeeded, and then they took away his exemption from the war. And was told, hey, you're going to World War II now, haha, <laughs> that's how we'll get rid of you. And... But, yeah, I that's, I think, all I will say on Disc 2, Parts 3 and 4. But, yeah, it's still one of my favorites of all time. I don't know if I could watch it all in one sitting. I think I would need lots of time to ruminate and kind of forget details and... Ah, my jaw's killing me. And all that, but, um, yeah, I'm loving it. Uh, I guess I'll be back and for you guys for a few seconds in a few seconds for me it'll be tomorrow when I watch the final disc I have three hours left if it's like it's like around nine and a half hours uh, disc one was three and a half hours this disc was three hours so not better paced but definitely felt shorter that last one was just oh my gosh <laughs> but um talk to you guys Hello everyone, so I am back. I have just finished film three or part three of Misaki Kobayashi's The Human Condition. Um, I don't even know where to begin in terms of speaking about part three. I'm going to discuss that first and then kind of talk about my overall reactions. And discussing the essay and the interview that I, uh, I guess, absorbed when I finished this film, but, um, part three is all about, um, Kaji, our main character, um, wandering the landscape after an intense battle that left 157 people dead out of 160 that were part of his squad that he is in a, a platoon with, I guess, but, um, he and his two, uh, I guess members of his squad wander the landscape and they find other people they get separated they come back together it's just, for that entire first part of this uh, part three the first half it is absolutely um, not as devastating as the other parts but it's very harrowing very dreadful what uh, Kaji has to do in order to survive he is much different in this part than he was in part one his uh, humanist impressions are a lot less prevalent he um, is slapping people around he kills people often during this part of the uh, of the film and it is just absolutely incredible and I will not spoil the ending but the second half is him being captured by the Soviets as they um, go into Manchuria in order to rage war on uh, the Manchurians I believe but um, I'm a little hazy on that side of history but um, he gets captured and becomes a prisoner of war in one of the Soviet concentration camps and what ends the movie is just so sad depressing what his ultimate fate is and I knew ahead of time that this was his fate of what happens and I think it added another layer to this movie and so I'm not going to spoil it but if you know what happens, I think it enriches the watch because especially this part as 
because it's about three hours and ten minutes, this part of the movie. And while I was watching it, in my head, I keep a kind of what time will it end. So if I see it's three hours and I look at the clock and I'm like, okay, in three hours, roughly, it'll end. And I was getting close to that, um, that time that I had set in my head of around the time when the movie would end and it did not look good for Kaji at all. And it was just so tragic, very sad. We get um, a voiceover with um, him and his wife talking and that part just completely destroyed me while watching it. And I think watching it straight through from the first scene of the movie all the way to the end in one sitting, all nine and a half hours, oh, I don't know how I will be able to handle that. But um, this movie is just absolutely incredible, just to kind of speak more broadly about the movie now, about the overall experience. I truly believe that everybody should watch this just everybody ever should watch this movie because as the title indicates the human condition it investigates humans and uh, the characteristics and looking at the uh, how our main character he's always fighting against corruption or greed or injustice and all this different things and the entire time he never wins he's always being defeated somebody betrays him he is not given what he needs to do in order f for him to fail there are many points where people just deny him food or water or anything just because of who he is and what he believes and watching this movie I could really see that the director was drawing from his real world experiences. And there's a great interview with Tatsuya uh, Nakadai, who plays Kaji. And he talks about how, you know, this was his third movie he acted in, which blew my mind. I really thought he had done more movies. And the two ones that he did before this were also Kobayashi movies. Except in those, he played gangsters or Yakuza members. And in this one, he plays a very kind person who um, is always trying to do the good thing, but never works. Never works out. And there's a great part of that interview where he uh, discusses how as he was assuming this role of Kaji, he stopped worrying about the role and more trying to capture who the director was because he said as he was making the movie that the director would have chats with him and kind of talk about you know what he felt and he said he focused more on capturing his mannerisms and his character a lot more than the book character that because this is based on a giant giant book and there's a part where he discusses how the original author of the movie, or the book, thought this was just the perfect adaptation. And it's, I assume it's true, because this was a very tragic, amazing movie throughout. I was just blown away, and the fact that this was his third movie that he acted in just blew my mind watching it. But, um, it was just incredible, and everybody needs to see this the criterion cell is gonna go on for another two weeks or so go get it go watch it go experience this um whether you binge watch all nine and a half hours or you do what i do which is watch it in parts because it is there are intermissions there are titles after each section that says part one finish part two part three all that so please go watch it this was just a very incredible movie, and I am just, it's not often anymore that I find movies that I can say are easily in my top five.
it has been a while since I have said that. I don't think I've said that while doing this channel. I haven't found... I've found really great movies, of course. But to find a movie that is up there with like Seven Samurai and Akiru, uh, Lord of the Rings. I mean, I know a lot of people will probably be like, Lord of the Rings, what? But to me, that those movies are very perfect in terms of filmmaking, everything. But um, this movie is... I don't think I'm going to be watching movies the same after this. This movie was just absolutely incredible. I absolutely loved it. Um, the essay in here is absolutely incredible. It's kind of in a layout that I don't like, which is um, it drops down into this large um, fold out and you kind of have to finagle it like a xylophone to close it but what's nice if you're gonna watch this you can split it up into three parts you can watch all three at once you could split it up like I did and to me it doesn't really matter because my gosh this movie was absolutely just amazing I can't stop saying that my deepest deepest thanks to Daisuke Beppu a fellow youtuber on here who inspired me to make this channel he recommended this heavily to me and said you know this movie is one of the best movies out there it is very uh, introspective and a great movie to think on and to analyze and research on and it's done by the same guy who did Harakiri and Quite On, two of one of my favorite movies of all time. So I had to go get it. And especially when I found out it was nine and a half hours. Wow, I, I've never seen a movie that long. Because I watch The Lord of the Rings back to back to back, all three of them in one sitting every year, just to kind of, um, I guess, just celebrate how great that movie is and how influential it was to me and all my hobbies and interests in life since I was a kid seeing those in the theaters but um, those movies are split up into like three and a half to four and a half hour movies I don't think I've seen another movie that is as long as this let alone double the length of the Lord of the Rings movies, the individual ones at least, and my god, it did not feel it at all. I'm sure even binging it, it doesn't feel that way, because they are three distinct movies, that's how he structured it, it's not actually three movies, he himself says, watch it all at once, Tatsuya Nakadai talks about how he's seen it from beginning to end, multiple times in the theater uh, he talked about how in Japan they show this movie every year in its entirety for like a couple weeks in order to uh, keep it you know in the public uh, conscience I guess and I wonder if they still do that today it would be very fascinating to watch this movie in the theater it would be incredible I think but at the same time I'm very wary about theater audiences and these type of movies that are very serious but in my head I reconcile that by thinking like okay but like nobody is gonna go watch this just to like be negative about it it's like it's like when you see a new movie and the audience is you know being rude the loud on the phones. I feel like if I was to see this movie in a theater, everyone in the audience would be just like me and be very quiet. Um, don't Not even looking at their phones. Maybe during the intermission. But I would love to see this in a theater. So I'm going to keep my eye out <laughs> and see if any showings happen. But um I don't know what else to talk about in regards to part three or the overall experience, except 
everyone must do this. Everyone must have this experience. Because this has deeply moved me as a person. I think my worldview has shifted after watching this and definitely feeling the same thing as the director felt when it came to um, just really um, having the theme of doing what you can even if you fail in terms of doing the good thing and standing up to injustice and all that. And it's very tragic that our main character never succeeds. And it always bounces back at him or backfires anytime he does anything good. So, I think that's it. Thank you all.